So, so get arrested. Once we come out, this was a trip. We come out, it's probably like 100, 150 of my homeboys and homegirls right there. So that was like the last sight of me, seeing them and seeing me for 15 years. But when I came out, the newsstands was out there and like I just seen like all of my homeboys and homegirls out there and that was the last time we seen each other until I got home in 2011. I had a co-defendant, which is which was one of my homeboys, and we sat and discussed everything. And um, yeah, we was gonna try to fight it, bro. You know, and and you know, cause even though they came and 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 got me the way that they did, we still had action at beating the case. You know, due to um, technicalities and things like that. So we actually just we took it all away, man. But I was convinced once we got like to the point of where we was going to start trial. By my, by my auntie, she was just in the, in the stands out there crying, begging me to just take the deal. And um, I did. I just took it to 15 and went on and, and walked it off, man. And what did the, your, your co-defendant do? The same thing, yeah. He ended up, we ended up accepting the, 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 the plea bargain and... Was it a package deal where both you, both you guys had to take it, right? Yeah, we had to take it, yeah. yeah. One person couldn't take it and the other person go to trial, right? No, because they were actually trying to separate our case because my crime me had more action at, than me at beating it. You know, I had a little bit more things against me than he did. But by him being a true homeboy, he stuck it out with me and we wrote it out together even though he may have action at, you know, getting his dropped or reduced. You know, he stuck it with he stuck it in with me and we accepted the plea bargain and we did the time. Here in 15 years must have been like, ooh, yeah. Yeah, that was rough, you know. And I ain't gonna lie, bro. You know, I'm not the type of person that cry and shed tears and nothing like that, right? But for some reason, once they told me that and I got back to the, um, cause I was actually in a crib module at the time. And once I got back to the crib module and I was in a cell with my cousin from 60s. And um, so I felt a little, comf little comfort zone with that. But I sat there bro and not that I was crying but tears just couldn't stop. They, would, you know, they wouldn't stop coming down my eye bro for like 30 minutes. I had to change, you know. I knew that sitting in the crib module when I got the 15 years. The day I got the 15 years, I knew from that point something had something had to give, you know. Within myself I knew that. So I always kept that 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 you know that idea and I and I went in that time with the notion of being open to learning, you know, cuz previously I wasn't really open to it. I was just game banging and just, you know, my mom was just set on getting back on the streets and doing what I do. But this time was a little bit different, you know what I'm saying? Because I wasn't getting back on the streets anytime soon, you know what I'm saying? So I knew that within the next 10 years, 10 to 15 years, that I was going to be, I didn't get out, I was 37 when I got out. I went to jail when I was 23, and it's 37 when I got out, you know? So I, I understood, you know, there was going to be a big difference and I had to, you know, I had to grow. I had to, you know, challenge myself differently. And I did. When you, when you doing that type of time and you are around people like a level four settings it's like it's a difference there you know you know you have people there that's 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 into education you know what I'm saying that's into growth that's into to um to making what they believe in something purposeful you know what I'm saying so I was a part of that 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 trend you know up in there so, so I was so there was other people kind of thinking the same way you were thinking yeah and that and you kept that type of company exactly now let's reverse a little bit I want I want you to explain about the the crib module to those who don't understand not at that time I don't think they they have it the same way today but at that time they had separate modules they had that blood module mm -hmm. uh, I believe the blood module was 4300 and 4800 they had uh, the main line at that time I think it was 9500 which the Crips ran, but then they had Crip modules mm -hmm. for Crips that can't really be on the main line, right? right, right Can you explain right. all of that to those who don't understand? Because uh, first, 4800, that was before my time, but that was the Crip module. Um, I, when, when, when I came to the, the county jail in 94, they, they had the Crip module in 3200, Baker Row. That's where I was, and that's where like the Faux Trades was, the East Coasters, you know, the people that we get along with. 
we all have kind of like had the Baker Road thing. But it, that the Crip Module situation is like, for active gang members, that's where they sent you. You know, either by force or, or by choice, you know? So you have some people that come in there and want to go to the Crip Module to be with their homeboys, you know? Then you have some people that try to slip through and they see that you active out there in general population and they scoop you up and bring you to the Crip Module if you're out there terrorizing. You know, so it really all depends on you, you know? Because it, it wasn't like a, a mandatory thing, but that's where all the active gang members were. So if you was active at the time, that, you know, nine times 10, that's where you, you probably would have been. Now, isn't there uh, four different rows? You said Baker, but isn't there uh, Charlie Row and exactly. Denver so, Row and mm -hmm. what's Abel? Uh-huh. I see you had, on the 3200, you had um, Baker and Charlie. Baker and, Baker and Denver was the Crips. And then you had, what's, what's, what was the other one? Abel. Abel and, and Denver. And Denver was the Damus on the backside. So we could actually hear them in events, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I made a decision, man, that I was going to prepare myself for coming home, you know what I'm saying? So that changed a lot of, it changed my reading habits. It changed, you know, the way I, I was thinking. It changed, it, it changed a lot, you know what I'm saying? Because I had to focus on like coming home as opposed to the pit, the prison environment, you know, cause being completely caught up with, the, with, with, with that prison shit, you know, you can lose sight of, 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 of coming home. And I realized that earlier in my, in, in, in my joke, when I was kind of like educating myself with um, black history. I have a family, you know what I'm saying? So I have, a, I, have a, I have a wife and I have like, you know, stepkids and I have, you know, a child, 20, tw my son is 25. And I have stepkids, you know, that's 20, what's it, 24, it's eight, um, 16 and 15. Okay, so you had this, your son, before you did that long stint. Yeah, 92, he was born. Okay, so you weren't there for most of his life. What's he that? was gone at eight. I left him at three, and when I came back, he was 18. Man, uh, you gotta talk about that. What was that like to see him, a man? Yeah. Yeah, that was, to leave my son at three and to come back and he's 18, that was, that was, that was different, you know what I'm saying? It was interesting. But what I did learn in prison, dealing with some lifers that had to go through the same process of building a relationship with their children from prison, you know, I learned how to do that, you know what I'm saying? Because I asked those type of questions, you know? So I learned how to stay consistent with my child even though he might not write back, you know what I'm saying? I know how to, you know, call and talk to him even though he may not want to talk, you know? So I learned that it's up to me as a parent not to give up. So I never did, you know, so we formed a relationship throughout that time to, you know, to the point to where he did have an understanding of who I was when I got out, you know, but from that point, it was, it was a whole nother rebuilding process that we still going through. Okay, so uh, we talked about your grandmother early on. Uh, you're free. Is your grandmother still around? And what's that relationship like? Uh, my grandma, she's still around. She's, she didn't got older now, so she's, you know, being more sickly and, but you know, she's still around. She's still um, lovable, you know? And she's still like trying to make sure that I stay on the right path, you know? Like right now I've been out seven years. So up, upon me getting out of prison, I was provided with the opportunity to be a part of a reality show called Pet Bulls and Parolees. That's right. So I, I did that for like a year, you know. My parole officer was hating on me, so he wouldn't let me travel once they moved to Louisiana. He stopped that. And um, after that, I started working. And I worked for five years straight, you know. So she had a chance to, to be proud of me, you know. So, um, and she's still, you know, proud of me. But yeah, see, she, I had a chance to, to change her heart and change her mind a little bit. And what was your experience on the show like? Um, well, I was, I was, I, I went to a, 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 a say for instance, my last six months, I went, I went, I, I went to New, um, Old Folsom. And when I got to Old Folsom, they had a program there that was tailored towards people who would do it, did a lot of time. And it gave them the resources once they got out to, you know, to handle their business. So I went to a work source that they provided and it helped me a lot getting out from doing that much time, you know? And during the process of me there, they had a audition for that show. And I'm, I'm looking at it, I'm like, damn, 
pet bulls. Like, I love pet bulls. I ain't talking about being on this. I'm like, yeah, so that's a win-win. So I went and done it, done the audition, and I had a second audition. I went and, 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 and I got hired to be a part of it. And, and that all the people on the show were inmates or mm -hmm. former inmates. Former, right? like, yeah. And what was it like to be with a bunch of other dudes that just got out of jail, too? See, the only difference was, like, the majority of the dudes, you know, had done little time. They hadn't done a lot of time, you know. So it was it was a big difference between me and them. But as far as the show is concerned, um, that was a good experience for me, man, getting out of prison. Because before then, I never had worked before. I never had a job or anything like that. So getting out and then being part of that and see, first and foremost, it's a it's Villa Lobos Rescue Center. So it's a pet bull rescue. And they had like 150 pet bulls that we had to deal with on a daily basis, you know, from feeding them in the morning to cleaning their cells, I mean, cleaning their cages, to like, you know, doing all of those type of things and, and making sure that they were straight. So it helped me getting out to build a work ethic, you know. The whole goal of the show was to, to um, for, for one, you say if you have, for instance, you have a, um, a ex-con and you have a, a pit bull who both have bad raps, you know what I'm saying? Like the, the ex-con got a bad rap, pit bull got a bad rap. So it's like, you know, um, us, helping each other, like, that that's what I got up out of it, because in learning how to deal with the animals, you know, kind of learn more about yourself in the process, you know, because when you're dealing with these animals, you have to deal with each one differently as if you would have to deal with a human, you know, because their personalities are different. So I'm dealing with 150 pit bulls, so the, I'm dealing with the ones in my section, and I'm noticing, like, okay, you can't walk in the same cage and deal with this one the same way you deal with that one. It's not gonna happen. So, you know, I had to learn how to, you know, adjust and to deal with, you know, the behavior of the animal, which, you know, kind of like, you know, related to me dealing with, you know, people a little bit differently. Seeing it like that, you know, just being able to view it like that, like, okay, this person right here, I might have to talk to him, you know, just a little bit differently, you know, his temperament might, you know, I might can't say to him what I can say to you, you know, so, yeah, it, it, it taught me a, a, a little something. I think the government, they say once you're in the hood, you're always a criminal. Right. And there are different ways of looking at this, and they only look at it one way. Right. Well, I can say, man, just being from this neighborhood myself, and for a long period of time, um, I mean, you can, you can still represent where you come from without getting caught up into all of the negative aspects about it. Because, at, you know, first and foremost, it's a community. Not everybody in the community is bad. You know what I'm saying? Or have bad intentions or, or anything like that. You know what I'm saying? So with the full PC photography, that's what we want to do. Like lead by example that you can do something different. We picking up a camera, not a gun. You know what I'm saying? So we want to show something different in that aspect. Full PC photography for positive change. And um, we're like a, a, a we, 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 we cater to the community. You know, we, we started in the community. And, and that's, that's a big plus, man, because you have a lot of people who can achieve things, and, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, I've been out seven years, and through those seven years, you know, they've been small accomplishments, but I've been able to accomplish, you know, a little, a little things, you know, to enough to like make me know that okay, it's a, it's a, it's it's something out here. I take pictures for a living, you know. So when you when you, when you look at it like that, that's what I want my homeboys and homegirls to see that you know, just because you have on a T hat or a G hat, that don't mean that you don't work. You know what I'm saying? That don't mean that, you know, you don't go to school. It don't mean that you're not educated, you know? All these things you could still be, you know? We just have to, you know, take it amongst our, upon ourselves to, to accept that challenge. And I, I, and I just want to be like, you know, a leading example of that. Thanks for watching StreetGangs.com. Please like and share the video you just watched and leave a comment below to tell us what you think. You can also watch two of our previous episodes to the right. Please visit the link to our Patreon page and support our campaign. And don't forget to subscribe.